All right, we're in John chapter 15 today. John chapter 15. Title of my message is When Rules Are Love. Mark Twain Exposed. And we will explain that as we move on. Let's get our text in our mind right now. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and the Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now are ye clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Verse 9 will be my text for today. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken in you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Dear Lord, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the scripture reading today, the preserved word of God. Thank you. Lord, we do pray we will continue in your love, your loving rules, your loving ways, your loving revelation, God, your protection, your guidelines. It's for our good, God. And we don't want to be independent of your ways, Father the way that seemeth right to a man. We want to walk in your truth, God, and help us, Father, to continue in your love, your loving rules, your loving truth. And, Father, we do pray that we will rebuke the spirit of this wicked age and that you will help us stand against it, God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. I'll just give you a brief commentary. This is not meant to be an exposition on John chapter 15. But what it says is, you're called as a Christian to be a disciple of the Lord. And our Lord is the vine, and you, as a believer, are the branches. If you bear fruit, you're going to get purged. You're going to get a lot of attention. And you're going to wonder, why is the Lord dealing with me? Why am I going through these things? And it's because God knows you're bearing fruit, and He is just causing you to bear more fruit, okay? He is working in you uh, to have the capacity to bear more fruit. You're going to go through some things, some purging, some pruning, if you will. If you do not bear fruit, as a believer, you are not glorifying God. You're bringing shame to Christianity. You're bringing shame to His name. And if you continue not to bear fruit, you will be taken away. That either means physical death or your light just gets turned out. It's called, being, it's called falling away in the Bible. That does not mean losing eternal salvation. But it does mean as a believer, you are set aside. And I'm going to tell you, he says down here that at the judgment seat of Christ, you've got the terror of the Lord coming to you. And I do believe that God means business. And He means what He says. People don't like that. They don't like the warnings of the Bible. But I'm telling you that there is a price to pay for not bearing fruit in your Christian life. And uh, you can read about that in Matthew 25, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 10, and elsewhere. Now, He goes on to say that He wants you to continue in His love. And then he tells you in verse 10 that abiding means to keep the commandments of God. As he says in verse 7, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. If you keep the commandments of God, you are abiding in his love. So his love is expressed in his commandments. Now, praise God for His grace, because we would not even be able to keep His commandments. It would be no sense in even keeping them, because we've already sinned, and we are condemned and lost. But because of His grace and mercy, that is a part of His love that has forgiven us of our sins. But listen here. The commandments are also a part of His love. 
God's loving commandments are for our protection. When you tell a child not to run across the road and to obey you, that is for his protection. You understand that. Well, we've got a Hollywood world out here that for centuries really, but certainly in the 20th century and 21st century, rules are presented as something to mock. Rules are seen as oppressive, something against you. And of course, there are rules that should not be rules. But God's rules are perfect. Do you understand that? The Bible is perfect. His commandments are not grievous. They're for our good. So as we look in America at Independence Day, you better not be independent from the Lord Jesus. You understand that? You are to abide in Him, stay in Him. And what He means is you're to stay in His Word, walk in His light, stay with His commandments, understand the importance of God's rules, and don't look at them as some horrible thing, some strange thing. God says, I wrote unto them the great things of my law, but they counted it a strange thing. No, His commandments are not against you. Study them. Thirst after God's righteousness. Learn God's ways and be excited to grow in the Lord and find out what else God has for your protection. If God says, look not at the wine, that's for your protection. To keep you from being addicted to alcohol and be a drunkard and have all of the problems associated with that. God's ways are for your good. And your father's commandments, your mother's commandments... Uh, if they're walking in God and walking in the truth, therefore you're good. You understand that? He goes on to say, I've spoken all this to you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. If you want to be like Cain, a miserable, a miserable person, if you want to, in your Christian life, have depression and true sorrow, I tell you what, just disobey the commandments of God. But God loves you. He wants you to be happy. And I'm going to tell you something. Little children that aren't spanked and dealt with, little children that are allowed to smart off to their parents, they are not happy children. They are miserable children. Miserable children. And right now, there are forums online, parenting forums, where parents, mamas are in desperation. My child says she hates me. My child screams at me. My child says all kinds of things. What do I do? And they're in confusion because the world has sold them a bunch of lies. They put Disney before these children. They put movies before these children that mock parental authority, as we've been discussing and documenting. And then the child mocks the parent. And they're like, then they try to teach the child obedience, but you're giving them propaganda that teaches them disobedience. What a world we're living in. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Get the trash out in front of you, away from your children. And mamas, learn to teach your children obedience and command obedience. Demand obedience. And get rid of the Dr. Spock stupidity that is still here in America. After all these years, after ruining the country, the trash is still present today. We've got a wrong view of love today. When is the last time there has been a children's movie that showed the, the loving rules of the parents as an expression of love? You do not see that hardly ever do you see an authority, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a father, giving rules, and that is actually love. That is not presented as love. But I'm telling you, that is a very important part of love. And I'll explain that. Look at Leviticus 19. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. People say, well, I think we ought to love one another. Well, that's what the Bible says. But how is love expressed in Leviticus 19? Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. It didn't say shalt not rebuke him. It said thou shalt rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. To let somebody go off in sin, is that love? To let your little child play on a railroad track when a train's coming, is that love? No, to let somebody go off in drug, to let them destroy their marriage, to let a child go off in rebellion. That's not love. God says don't hate people. Love them. Don't let them fall in sin. Proverbs 27, open rebuke is better than secret love. This secret love, it doesn't help anybody. Some parents have secret love. They say, oh, I love my boy. No, you don't love your boy. If you loved your boy, you'd slap him. People say, oh, I can't believe you would say something like that. No, if your child's smarting off to you, discipline your child. Proverbs 13, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. 
That means while you have that limited window of opportunity to get it done, take care of it directly. You're not going to have this opportunity to train your children. People say, my child's pretty good because you never give him any commandment. But you get around them and you see all kinds of disobedience. And then some people think, they think it's cute. I've seen Christians smile and think it's cute when a child is smarting off. Isn't he growing into a man? No! I've been teaching for many years against momism, this overprotection, this rescuing your child from every little trouble. Some boys smart off because one thing about Christianity and a lot of churches, there's hardly no danger for a boy. See, when you're out in the world playing basketball with a bunch of worldly kids, and I do not want you around worldly kids, but you smart off around them, you'll come home with a bloody nose, see. And sometimes that can be good for a child, okay? Don't get me wrong. Don't misquote me. Don't put me on CNN. But I'm telling you that there is an aspect of teaching your child to guard his mouth that the mama and daddy ought to be teaching. And sometimes you learn it out in the world when mama and daddy doesn't, don't teach you that type of thing. But you ought to be there to teach your child to shut your smart mouth. And mamas, it is not hindering the manliness of your boy to tell him to shut his smart mouth and make him shut his smart mouth from disrespecting you. I want to just get that straight. Children left to themselves bring mama to shame. It's not funny to have a child smarten off to you. Hebrews 12, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Again, God loves you, so God chastises. God loves you, so God gives you commandments. God loves you, so He makes loving rules for you to follow that save you from death, save you from depression, save you from destruction, save you from greater sin, save you from hell. The Bible says you shall beat your child and you'll save his soul from hell. Nobody believes that anymore. I'm not believing in some type of wicked abuse. I'm believing in parental chastisement for the purpose of saving your child by correcting them. It's non-existent today, pretty much, in the churches of America. Verses 9 and 10 say, continue in God's love. Continue in God's loving ways. Continue in God's rules. And then if you doubt my exposition, he tells you in the very next verse, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. There it is. There it is. God's commandments are an expression of His love. Abide in His love. You hear so much about God's love today in this Joel Osteen, Oprah Winfrey generation. So much. Love, 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 love. But nobody tells you what it is. Nobody tells you obedience to God is love. Nobody tells you that God's expression of love was not just His mercy, but it's His love to tell you what to do and keep you from sin. Independence Day, as we said, is upon us in the United States. And Independence Day is one of those strange days like Father's Day. When people celebrate, they have fireworks, but, but really everything they give you in the propaganda is against the whole day, uh, against the idea of independence. Now, they want you to be independent from God. They want children to be independent from fathers. They want you to be independent from, from pastors and that type of thing. But they do not want you to be independent from state or state propaganda. Do you understand that? So we're celebrating Independence Day in America, but yet, what a contradiction. What a strange contradiction. You mock the ideas that our founders stood for. It is ridiculed, repudiated, forgotten. There is a satanic independence. They want you independent from God, independent from that Bible, independent from the old paths that our forefathers used to trod. But they don't want you independent from state control. See, the revolution was fought over state control. Britain's control of the colony, America. And they launched the revolution to be independent from control of this foreign power over the colonies. 
Everything today is licensed and controlled as we continue to move toward the Antichrist, New World, One World Order that the Bible says will come in Revelation 13. Medicine is controlled today. That is one of the most stupid. In all of the libertarian liberalism, everybody talking about wanting free from government control, what, only Ron Paul and a few others dare speak about one of the worst things to have the government involved in is medicine. Do you understand that? I meant to say that you cannot be a doctor unless we say you're a doctor. And you have to prescribe these drugs from the pharmaceutical companies. That's what you become today as a doctor. You become a salesman. Not, you, you don't learn about nutrition. You don't learn about what really helps people. You become a salesman for million, billion dollar pharmaceutical companies. And it's a licensed state-controlled system. They just locked up a poor Amish fella who's just trying to sell ointment to help people. See, this is where we're at in America. And we're going to have July 4th, Independence Day, when there's a poor Amish fella sitting in jail for trying to give somebody an ointment that would really help somebody. Happy July 4th. Give me a break. What type of drugs are you on? Oh, I realize, I forgot. Education is controlled. The medical system is controlled. I'm tired of hearing people talk about independence. It's time we free medicine and free education from state control. It'll fix all your problems. All this health care thing, all of that will go away. No more problems. Not the way we have problems today. I'm going to tell you something. The chains of Britain were nothing compared to the chains today. Are you listening? But then again, men were different then. They said, no way are you going to chain us in that way. And they went to war. They thought Catholicism was already being established in Canada. Look, look how far Canada has gone now. You can barely even say your child, to tell your child to take a dress off if he's a boy or, or they'll try to arrest you. I mean, that's insane what type of laws they're passing in Canada. But I'm telling you, they knew that Catholicism was being established in Canada and they shed blood to keep uh, Catholicism from being established in America today. And they went to war rather than Submit to the chains that Britain was putting upon our founders. Now listen, the men were different for a lot of reasons, uh, but they were not chemically and nutritionally and mentally robbed of their backbone and got gumption. Those men had backbone because they didn't eat what you eat, whether spiritual eating or physical eating today. In our text, Christians are commanded to abide in the Lord, stay in unity with Him. The early founders said that rebellion against tyrants is obedient to God. Rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God. Now don't get me wrong today. You hold on a second. Don't jump to a conclusion. I do not necessarily agree with that statement. And many Christians back then did not agree with that statement. You need to qualify that statement. Many Christian leaders, such as John Wesley, disagreed with the whole revolution. I think, for the most part, they were wrong. But see, the revolution was not just made up of Christians and Baptists. It was made up of Enlightenment people, Age of Reason people... It was made up of people that were plain infidels also. Masons, infidels. There was a lot of people involved in the revolution, see. And God can use all of that. He can use sin. That doesn't mean go sin. But the Bible says He can work things for good and cause things to fall out. And when some people mean things for evil, God can cause the wrath of man to praise Him. But listen to me. The Bible teaches that the mere forwardness and disobedience of an authority does not remove the Christian responsibility of obedience. Read 1 Peter 2. Read 1 Peter chapter 3. Read it. Read it plainly and see. Just because you have a tyrant for a boss, just because you have a tyrant for uh, an authority does not automatically give you the right to rebel. 
Just because your father may uh, sometimes get out of line and be a mean man, that doesn't give you the right to disobey him, see. You need to get that clear. That's something that's lost when you see either side of this argument. You have people either absolutely, Romans 13 applies everywhere, just never disobey authority. Then you've got the people that recognize you need to qualify that, and there's a time to disobey authority. But sometimes these people, uh, they're unbalanced in their rebellion, see. So we need to have a biblical view of authority. And this idea that if rebellion is disobedient, I'm sorry, if authority is disobedient, you can automatically rebel, that's not in the Bible. But let me say this. If the commands of that rebellious authority are sinful, if they are not merely a rebellious behavior, but they are commanding you to do something sinful, then you have not only the right, but the obligation to disobey. Now listen to me, this is very important. The founders of the American Revolution did not merely argue that the laws and regulations from Britain were oppressive. That is not the only argument they gave. Yes, they thought that they were oppressive. And they did argue that just for trifling things, we're not going to disobey. But when you have this degree of uh, oppression... They did believe that there was a time for, for rebellion. But listen to me now. They did not only argue that they are disobeying the king because of oppression. They also argued, and this is very important, this is what made the revolution happen. They said that the authority was not lawful or even legitimate based on contract. I don't have time to get into that. But they had documents to prove that the power that Britain was exercising over the colon colonies was not legitimate. Not only was it oppressive, it was not legitimate. And that is something that you need to study. And I can show you more about that later. Now, authority can be resisted for not operating in its lawful realm. And certainly for not being a legitimate authority. If Mr. Green, the farmer, shows up in your house tonight, when you, or let's say when you go home, and he says, you know what, these curtains right here aren't good, and uh, wife, I want you to go over here, and we're going to have chicken for dinner tonight. You're going to say, why is Mr. Green in my house? And what do you mean we're having chicken tonight? You don't have any lawful authority in my home. Who are you? Why are you here? And why are you trying to command me, the wife? See, if authority is not legitimate... <laughs> But, but, but a lot of times, somebody just dresses up a certain way and says, do this, and you wouldn't believe what people will do. See, authority has to be legitimate, and that is a whole other important aspect. And they did not believe that Britain's authority was legitimate. Now, although I believe the American Revolution uh, can be justified, uh, it's also true, listen to me now, that there was an enlightenment spirit that was naturally against authority, and the reason the enlightenment spirit was against authority, brother, is because they believe that it suppresses reason. And remember, they had made reason to be God. You didn't need revelation, children. Listen to me now. Try to pay attention and understand. You didn't need the Bible because they said man's mind is all we need. The Christians tried to show them that man's mind is limited, that you need the Bible. And you had great debates between Butler and Hume and all of these things. Uh, but listen to me. They said that the Roman Catholic Church put us in the dark ages and suppressed truth. Oh, we would agree with that. I mean, the gospel was suppressed. The very Bible itself was suppressed. And in many ways, uh, the Catholic Church did put mankind in the dark ages. But everything that came out of the so-called awakening and enlightenment was not of God. See, just as it caused the Bible to be open and, and in the presence of people's hands, the witches also came out of the closet. All of the warlocks and witches and occultists, they came out of the closet too. So the enlightenment was filled with a lot of occultists, a lot of masons, a lot of uh, infidels that hated God. You need to know this. Many of the leaders of the age of reason were satanic. 
Some of them were anti-Bible, anti-God. Think of Voltaire, Hobbes, David Hume, Rousseau, Isaac Newton, Kant. All the men today, if you go to college or junior college or even high school, they'll make you study. These are their heroes. Now, they don't like what they wrote about state control, but they want to, that they love the anti God, anti Bible teachings of these humanists. Now, we have seen the 20, 20th and 21st century attacks on fathers and parental authority using children's films and books. But you need to know the seeds of this were planted in the 18th century. See, the, inf the infidels were anti-Bible, anti-family way back then. It's just taking them so much time to get fully in control of Hollywood and the media. But in one sense, they were influential even back in the 18th century. See, in the 18th century, these men who hated God and hated the Bible, they saw parental authority as something that was against the development of children. Because her parents could take the child and teach him the Ten Commandments and teach him the Bible, teach him to read the Bible, Luke. And they wanted little humanists, see. They wanted these children to develop their reason in a way that these Enlightenment leaders would agree with. So they thought that parents were suppressing the maturing, the development of children. Just like today. Remember, Hillary Clinton wrote, It Takes a Village. They see parents as a threat to children. So, It Takes a Village by Hillary Clinton. She wants experts appointed by the state to come in to houses, even when children are not even ready for I mean, their preschool. And she wants them to look at the children and, and, and basically be in charge of the children, see. So this is an old idea that we need to get children away from the parents so the state can control them. Well, today they have Disney and children's books. And they can control the children. Back then they didn't have Disney, but they had novels. And these Enlightenment leaders that were infidels against God, they used novels in the 18th century to teach rebellion against fathers. In many of the 18th century novels, the father was tyrannical. And the savior of the novel was often the tutor. Do you get it now? See, fathers are bad. Tutors who come in the house that are not biological fathers, they are good, see. Samuel Johnson in 1750 says, These books, these novels are written chiefly to the young, the ignorant, and the idle. A writer named Sylph in 1796 says, Women are addicted to these things. My sight is everywhere offended by these foolish yet dangerous books. So you need to understand that that verse, evil communications corrupt good manners, Christians were using it in the 18th century. They were saying, watch out, there's infidels. If they just gave you their writing and told you what it was about, you would reject it. You say, I don't want Voltaire's trash, that anti-Bible trash in my home. You're not going to read that, son. But if they gave your teenage daughter a novel, they were sneaking their rebellious teachings into the home through novels. Through novels. That's how it works. Boy, they are certainly happy today to use computer games and movies and wow. That, that's why Anton LaFay just, just laughed and chuckled and chuckled and says, you know, Every living room right now is a satanic altar. You know, when you watch TV, you're participating in satanic church. You know, he just laughed at the Christians. 
Just like Charles Potter in 1930 laughed at the Christians and says, you send your children to humanist church every day. And, and we have your children in our public school system. And the world sometimes just mocks Christians for how gullible and stupid they can be. Well, many people got angry. They said, these novels are undermining parental authority. They are teaching girls and women to live by their feelings instead of by reason. They're lewd. And they present an unrealistic view of love. They began to teach young women that when love comes upon you, you can't control it. If you have romantic feelings for somebody, you can't be expected to control that and do the right thing. See, that's what these romance novels do. Oh, you must follow the urge, even if it's wrong, even if it's against God, even if the fellow's not a Christian. And not only that, they began to say that when you have true love, your marriage will just be this fairy book story and there will be no problems and no trials. And if you have the right person, you'll never have any conflict. Is that true? Hey, I'm telling you, you get the person God wants you with, you're going to have conflict. People that have survived marriages for 60 years said, we went through the hard time. We didn't believe in divorce. Yes, we had hard times. Yes, we had conflict. But you know what? You don't give up on your marriage. You keep your covenant, see. Well, if you're full of all this childish, actually satanic propaganda, you're going to get very confused about what life is supposed to be like. Goethe began to write some novels. In one, many felt that he romanticized suicide. He gets you involved in this character who, 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 who ends up in self-pity. And uh, basically, people started killing themselves after reading Goethe's novel. And Goethe was very upset about it. But what did you think was going to happen? When you present heroes, when you, put, when you put characters in a book and get people wrapped up in the character and then let the character lead them on a path to no good, it gives people an excuse, but it also influences them. Now, Christian homeschooling is sometimes filled with 18th century novels. And they think that these are good books. And there is some debate about, certainly they're a lot better than anything you can read today because they had to bury some of the things that they were saying. They could not be as open as you can today in a Disney movie, you know. But Maximilian Novak says, Although Robinson Crusoe's sense of guilt over his disobedience and his repentance is real enough, Robinson Crusoe, a novel in 1719, was not a book intended to inculcate lessons of obedience in the young. Rather, it was an imaginative and exciting exploration of a series of adventures that occur because Crusoe was disobedient. That all should end well in the end shows Defoe, the author, was creating a narrative in which defiance of parents could produce a relatively happy conclusion. Now, many will disagree with that today. They will say, well, no, Robinson Crusoe, the author, shows that his, his obedience, he repented of being disobedient to his father. Well... The fact that there's a debate about this, the fact that so many Christians at the time were against many of these novels shows that maybe we better open our eyes a little bit. Maybe there were things these authors could not say as boldly as later centuries they learned to say. See, they had to kind of dance around some of these themes in earlier days. Well, I'm going to tell you, by the time you got to the 19th century, and Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, the cat's out of the bag, folks. There's no playing around with these ideas anymore. I mean, it's just go ahead and rebel against your parents and who cares about it? I'm just going to be plain and tell you, yeah, go rebel because authority is bad. Ernest Hemingway said that all modern literature comes from Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. They said he just opened the door for everything. And you know what? Ever since Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, I mean, they just fought the whole 20th century went to hell. It was like, wow, we can do this. Every movie, every book, just rebel against the Father. I mean, it was just open.
I mean, you can't even sit down and watch a family show without seeing some teacher, some parental authority trying to control the children. And they finally take off their Sunday school clothes and rebel and get away from it all. And everybody chuckles and laughs. Oh, isn't that fun? But then you watch that stuff. And then you wonder why your rules are not seen as love by your children. You wonder why they look at the Bible and say, how is this loving for me? It's telling me to do something that I don't want to do. See, they've been taught that anytime God tells you to do something you don't want to do, it's somehow, you know, they love this, well, I'm just a different person. You're trying to deny my individuality. You're trying to make me into something that, that I'm not. And I tell you, that trash will destroy you. From the very time Eve fell because of that trash... That is the devil's lie from hell. If you want to be different, if you want to be your own self, then be the self God made you to be. Walk in the new man God wants you to be. Be what God wants you to be. And learn obedience to authority uh, when it's not commanding you to do something sinful. And I tell you what, you will be different. You will be an individual because everybody else is walking in rebellion. And so if you want to be different, then be obedient. That is the way to be different today. So in Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, I'm not, don't get me wrong, Mark Twain is very witty, but people that are witty are not always right. Do you understand that? You need to get that straight. Hitler taught people to use wit and propaganda to humiliate and repudiate uh, opposition. You can be sarcastic. Look at the liberals. Doesn't they make you sick? Some of those news programs and people like Bill Moyer, whatever his name is, uh, Bill Meyer, all these people. I mean, their sarcasm, their wit, it's disgusting is what it is. And, and it's not even funny, you know. But, but they're trying to be so funny, your late night talk show host. They're just a bunch of liberals. Uh, they're used by the devil, and it's not funny. But I am not saying that Twain, at least in some of his early books, was not a talented writer. You can be a talented singer and be used of the devil. You can be a talented speaker and be used of the devil. You can be pretty and use your body for sin. What does that have to do with anything? That does not excuse Mark Twain for what he did to children. Tom Sawyer in 1876 was a novel written by Mark Twain. I remember one Christmas as a boy, I received Huckleberry Finn. And even then, we didn't live a Christian life, but even then my mom says, I probably shouldn't give this to you. I don't know whether I should or not. And I said, why? Well, in some ways, that made me far more interested in reading the book, you know what I mean? And really, it was just a boy that goes through and disobeys all authority. It was the Harry Potter of the 19th century. One writer says, Huck lies, he steals, he smokes, he swears, he skips school, he accepts no authority, not from his father or the widow Douglas or anybody else. And it is the twin images of a perilous, harrowing odyssey of adventure and perfect freedom from all restraints that so many readers find interesting. In other words, Robinson Crusoe, adventure. I found all this adventure by disobey. So your modern Disney movie, same theme. From the 18th century, same theme. Okay, disobey authority and you find adventure and fun and it's exciting and you're going to have a good time. Just disobey. Leave your husband. It'll be an adventure. Disobey your father. Get out from under his control and you will have an adventure. What do you think the devil told Eve? Eat of that tree and you'll be as gods and you'll know things and see things that God's trying to keep you from seeing. Oh, it'll be a wonderful adventure. Tom Sawyer is presented as hating Sunday school with his whole heart. Oh, isn't that a wonderful thing to give a child? Oh, you want to be like Tom or Huck and hate Sunday school. What is Sunday school? If it's a good... Well, today it's mixed swim parties and eating pizza. But if you have a good church, it's learning about God, learning the things of God. And you hate that? How blasphemous. How wicked. Rules are not presented as loving in Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. 
there's a little bit of witchcraft, but by the time you get to Rowling's Harry Potter, it's Tom Sawyer on steroids. Just full-blown magic and witchcraft where he even rebels against the witches. And the witches say, oh, he's learning to be a good witch. He's learning the Alistair Crowley path to stardom. You let nobody get in your way. It's for you. It's about you. Just think about you. Don't think about your children. Think about you and your feelings. Don't think about your example to others. No. Just it's all about you. You being happy. You're not going to be happy. God says you want to be happy, you obey me. God says if you want to be full of joy, you do what I say. And I tell you about the sister in the Lord who backslid, who called me before she died of a brain tumor and says the only happy times of my life were when I was in that fundamentalist church. And I look back over my whole adventure that I have done and it's just all dung. And my only happiness was when I was there. She says, isn't that strange? No, it's not strange to me. It's not strange to me because when you're in the presence of God, when you're in the Holy Spirit-filled church, when you're in the presence of God and His ways and His protection and His preaching, uh, no, then there is a certain happiness and joy that you don't know you have until you get away from it. The prodigal didn't know how good he had it until he got away from it all. Then he was like, wow. Praise God His Father stayed the same. Amen. Praise God His Father didn't backslide. Praise God His Father didn't say, well, we need to have a seeker-friendly place around here and get rid of our standards and get rid of everything. No, His Father just stayed straight and true. So when the backsliders come home, they know there's a place to go to. Amen. That's the church we ought to be. Who is this man, Mark Twain? 2 Timothy says, whatever you read... You better know who's behind what, what type of teaching they're giving you. Who is the man behind Tom Sawyer? If Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, whatever they were doing in seed form in earlier centuries, he just came out blatantly and presented it, and it became the standard for the whole thaw of the 20th century. Who is this man? Like Charles Dickens, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, was a master Freemason. This isn't some conspiracy. Uh, and what's wrong with that word anyway? That's a Bible word. The Bible says they conspire against one another. But my point is, this, this isn't some uh, saying without any basis. You could go to Mark Twain Freemasonry, and uh, you can see plainly his lodge. You could see uh, that he was a plain Freemason. Now, there were some things that he said after his de uh, that, that were published after his death from his writings, and we know plainly what type of man he was. We know, as Masons, you can read Albert Pike, who says what we've been doing for centuries is teaching occultism and Luciferianism through allegory, through the use of of uh, fairy tales through the use of books and uh, uh, illustrations. So Mark Twain as a master mason poured out his hatred for God to all the children. To all the children. This blasphemous, wicked man was corrupting children what was in his heart when he was writing that Tom Sawyer hated Sunday school and now he's going to make an idol out of Sunday school? Mark Twain, in Following the Equator of 1897, says, Faith is believing something you know ain't true. Is that blasphemous? You know what? Faith gives glory to God. And in the Bible, faith is not blind. We have reasons for what we believe in the Holy Word of God. We might not see with our natural eye, but we see nonetheless, folks. Mark Twain says, Our Bible reveals to us the character of our God with minute and remorseless exactness. 
It is perhaps the most damnatory biography that exists in print anywhere. It makes Nero an angel of light. You know what he's saying? He's saying, yeah, the Bible shows you God, and it's not a pretty picture. It makes Nero look like a saint or an angel. This is the wicked, blasphemous, heretic, infidel that became the basis for American literature. He says the Bible is a mass of fables and traditions, mere mythology. Yeah, well, you're in hell right now. Tell me if it's mythology now. Remember the rich man who went to hell? And he says, I want you to please send somebody back to my brothers lest they come to the place of torment like this. It is real. It is real. And they were told, they don't need somebody to rise from the dead. You got the Bible. You've got the Bible. If they're not going to believe the Bible, they're not going to believe if somebody rises from the dead. Jesus did rise from the dead. They still don't believe it. Mark Twain says, One of the proofs of the immortality of the soul is that myriads have, have believed it. They also believe the world was flat. No comment. Mark Twain, If there is a God, He is a malign thug. What a wicked man! Find out who is teaching your children. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You better know who's teaching your children and what they really believe. You say, Pastor, I've never heard of Tom Sawyer, a Huckleberry fan. I, how does this have anything to do with me? Well, it does because it's the foundation for everything that came afterwards, okay? All modern entertainment is pretty much Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer on steroids, okay? It's the same teaching, same lie, satanic rebellion against fathers, in fact, here's a fellow that seems to uh, enjoy, he's happy about it. He says, the role of authority in Tom Sawyer's maturation. What does he mean? Which is like Harry Potter. Harry Potter becomes a good witch by disobeying the muggles and disobeying authority and disobeying his teachers. This writer says, authority is a representative of the adult world with all its rules, conventions, and institutions, which Clemens so harshly and ironically criticizes. It does not take the reader long to find out that in the character of Tom Sawyer, the force to defy authority is extraordinary strong. Of course it is. So much so that you have satanic rock bands when I was growing up, like Rush. They had a drummer, Neil Peart, who would write all these crazy theosophic lyrics. And uh, they had a song called Tom Sawyer, the modern day warrior. Tom Sawyer, he's presented as a hero. Why would Rush... This Luciferic, theosophic, uh, really just Ayn Rand type of enlightenment, uh, infidelity. Why would they praise Tom Sawyer to become one of their greatest hit songs? Uh, what are they presenting before you? Here's Paul Elliott, Rush, the story behind Tom Sawyer. Pert is particular identified with the book's central themes of rebellion and independence. Individuality was a recurring subject in Pearl's lyrics. In Pert's lyrics. In Pert's words, a portrait of the modern day rebel. So they write a song called Free Will. They say, if I, I don't get a choice, you know. You say, I got free will, but if I, if I choose to reject you, I go to hell. They said, how is that free will? So they're blaspheming God, see. So Tom Sawyer is the ultimate antichrist figure for these people. See, Pert knows that it was the foundation for all that came afterwards. Saul Alinsky, who Hillary Clinton followed, says ridicule is man's most potent weapon. So you put out these children's books ridiculing authority and you're laughing along at the authority. You're laughing with Tom. You're voting for Tom. You don't want Tom to go to Sunday school. You want him to take off his Sunday school clothes and go down to the creek and play with lizards. You're voting for Tom Sawyer. See, you're voting for the rebel. And the Bible said in the last days in 2 Peter 2, chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Oh, they don't despise government being in control of education and medicine and the churches. They despise government being in control of children in the home. They despise the government that is against them, see. Parental government. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. No, and they're not afraid to write books about it either. 
and characterize authority. See, you will not read Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and come out with a feeling that authority is loving. Rules are for your protection. No, you're not going to see that. See, You're going to see a whole mockery of it. I don't need that. You're trying to hold me back. You're trying to keep me from having fun. You go ahead and try it. You want to give that trash to your children and, and act like rules are keeping you from having fun? It's no wonder your children can't wait till they're uh, of age enough to defy you. They're going to defy you right to your face. And they're like, I don't understand why I'm being defied. Well, she was defying you and spitting in your face when she was three. What do you expect to happen? And then you fill them full of Hollywood every single day for the whole lot, 300, I can't compete against that with one hour. One hour a week and I'm supposed to try to teach children to obey? And you're feeding them with Hollywood propaganda, sometimes three movies a day, every single day of their life? And the movies have the same theme? Rebel, uh, rebel and you'll have fun. No, 1 Corinthians, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Hey, godly rules are not against God, people. Psalms 119 says, I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precept. You want to be free? Obey God. There's people right now saying, I'm not going to obey. The Bible says, look not at the wine, but that's fundamentalism. That's legalism. See, we can play around with wine. I remember a girl one time that used to go to church as a teenager told me, my parents have drank wine. I don't got to worry about that. We do it in moderation. Uh, see? I don't have to obey that. That's not liberty for me. You're trying to confine me. She ended up a drunk. She ended up a drunkard. And we were preaching downtown and here come her parents. Supposed to be missionary, outstanding citizens and godly Christians. And I said, hey, I know you. You're so-and-so. And they're burping and unable to walk. And the woman had to be held because they had gone out to a restaurant and got toasted. They are addicted to alcohol. They are drunkards. How did they become drunkards? Because they despise God's rules. His loving rules, see. That's just one example. Second Peter says they're going to promise you liberty, but don't listen to them. They're going to tell you it's okay to have boyfriends and girlfriends. and It's okay to hug and kiss and touch somebody that's not your husband. Then they end up in a lot of trouble. How did you get in trouble? See, the devil's ways don't work, do they? I thought you were going to find liberty by following the devil's ways. No, you didn't find liberty. You ended up pregnant. You ended up in sin. You ended up with a disease. You ended up in shame. Thomas Wirtz, 100 Reflections to Help You Become the, perf or the Complete Athlete. He has it right here. He says following Jesus means following a lot of rules. That's true. Oh, they hate that today. Oh, the, the modern community church that preaches on Wonder Woman, how good it is on Sunday, they are not going to like the idea that following Jesus means following a lot of rules. It's not only following a lot of rules, but there are rules in the Bible, yes. But Jesus loves us. They're good rules. And He gives us the strength to obey them, and we ought to obey them if we love Him. In my sport, if you take away the rules, you have no sport. You instead have chaos. The fun is gone. The game is lost and so is freedom. Lord, change my attitude. Help me to understand the great good that your rules provide me. Oh, our Lord says, continue in my love. The Lord says, abide in my love. Continue in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will continue in my love. You will abide in my love. My commandments are loving is what the Lord's saying. Here's Mary Ramirez. No, Katy Perry. Borders of the loving thing to do. She says it happens at least a dozen times a day. 
I take something away from my kid. I tell her she can't do something. I place limits on how far she can go. And someday when she's a little older, she'll be able to understand why she can't grab the kitchen knife off the counter or walk out into the street by herself or grab the dog by the ears. She'll know that I place limits on her to protect her, to keep her safe. Limits are loving. Rules are loving. Even punishment when those rules are broken is loving. That is absolutely true. It's so basic. It's common sense. You've got to be an idiot not to understand this. But there are people that can teach their dogs how to sit and obey. They can't teach their children how to sit and obey. What is wrong with America? Too many, too many movies. The whole culture is against. The whole culture ridicules rules. So rules are not seen as loving. Can rules be too strict? Yes. Can rules be unloving? Yes. But when you miss the fact that God's rules are good, you've got a problem. BMC Public Health, a research paper, says lack of parental rule setting on eating is associated with a wide range of adolescent unhealthy eating behavior for boys and for girls. Who would have ever guessed? You've got scientists, researchers that some of them have grants and they're at universities and they sit back and they say, let's look at the kids that aren't commanded what to eat when they're young. There's no rules for eating. They can just go get pizza, put it in the microwave, do whatever they want. They don't have to sit at the table. We don't have to wait to pray. There's no rules. Just go grab it and run off somewhere and do whatever you want, snack. Just eat whatever trash you want to. They follow these kids and they say, wow, they ended up with a lot of problems when it comes to eating when they got older. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. I wonder why. There were always Christians that tried to that tried to sound the alarm. Here's John Pulsford, Christ and His Seed, 1872, around the same time as Mark Twain and this whole spirit of rebellion was starting to be unleashed. He says, The parents who tolerate or mildly pass over the disobedience of their children tolerate what constitutes the beginning of all evil. The ch- I tell you what, you let a 10-year boy smart off, bye-bye. You've got 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Say, he's gone. He's gone. Another pervert boy. Another boy to bring shame upon the cause of Christ. He's gone. Bye. God forbid. It's so sad. The children who are permitted to make light of the authority of their father and mother will in all probability grow up to make light of the authority of God. Your son is not your buddy. It is not cute. When he disobeys you and disrespects you and speaks to you like you're his little sister. And he shouldn't be speaking to his little sister like that. In dishonoring their parents, they have already dishonored God. They have disgraced themselves, impaired their own moral sense given their consent to evil spirits as their allies and entered on the way which leads them to destruction. You are the parent and your job is to teach them that disobedience and disrespect do not pay. Tom Sawyer is a myth. Harry Potter does not exist. These are fairy tales. They're satanic illusions. And you are to teach your children that what the devil is saying is real is not real. You try that with your boss when you get a job, it's not going to work. He gives me this rule that I have to show up at a certain time. Yeah, he's always getting on to me, telling me not to be late. You know what? He's just such a, he has such a problem. Well, you taught your child that rules mean something bad, a denial of their individuality. He's not letting me be myself. <laughs> Bye-bye. They'll find an excuse to get rid of you. You'll be long gone. And then you'll be living with your mama because you can't get a job. And you can't get a job because you, dis- you can't respect authority.
Psalms 119 says, Though through thy commandment, thou through thy commandments, has made me wiser than my enemies. Wow, God's commandments are wisdom. If you're a good girl, there's a lot of ministries out there right now for teenage girls, and a lot of what they're saying is really good. And they have these sayings, these posters that say, when I keep these rules, it's not because I'm, I think I'm better than you or smarter than you in some way. I'm keeping these rules because I know myself. I know the evil I'm capable of. And so I look ahead and plan beforehand, but beforehand, and I don't put myself in situations where my evil nature can get the best of me. That's wisdom. God says, look not at the wine. God says, go not nigh the strange woman's house. God says, make not provision for the flesh. It's wisdom. And you will be a lot wiser than the foolish girls and foolish boys. Wow, your daddy doesn't allow you to text boys. Wow, your daddy, you got a block on your phone. Wow, you do this. Wow, that must be sad. No, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. I know what I'm capable of. My daddy's just protecting me. And you'll find out the hard way. You probably already have. He wants me to be happy. He's not trying to make me sad. He wants me on my marriage day to be happy. Some friend of our, friends of ours just got married. The daughter got married and on her wedding day, that's the first time she ever kissed anybody. It was her husband. That's how it ought to be. What a special, precious time that is. Her daddy protected her. She was obedient to obey her daddy. Praise God for that. For Proverbs 3, I'll read a few verses and close. My son, forget not my law. That's the law of your daddy. But let thy heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Wow, how often is that presented in a Disney movie? Your daddy's commandments lead to peace. Wow. No, they try to say it leads to unhappiness. Well, they're liars. Isaiah 48, Oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments, says God. Then had thy peace been as a river. The Lord knows His commandments lead to peace, brother. Wow. A river of peace you would have had. A river of joy. The Lord says in John 15, If my words abide in you, then my joy will remain in you. 1 John 5, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. People say, well, you just got to love Christians. Hey, you love Christian. You love your fellow believers when you love God and obey His commandments. Obedience to God is love for your brother. And you remember that. You want to hate your brother. All these people talking about, oh, well, they're just so full of hate and legalism. It's okay to drink and smoke and cross-dress and, and, and do all this other worldly evil stuff. It's okay. No, you're not loving anybody when you do that. You're hating your neighbor when you do those things. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. They're not against you. They're good for you. It's an expression of God's love. The rules of your Father are not against you. They're an expression of His love. When I tell you as a pastor, don't eat that junk. I want you to protect your teeth, protect your life, protect your body, protect your hormones. I'm trying to watch for your soul and love you. I know what's coming in your life if you break rules. See, I know what's coming in your life if you eat according to the flesh and make your silly, ridiculous excuses for not eating right. That's just one idea. That's just one little thing compared to all the other things people do many times. How many times I've gone to people and say, don't do that. Watch your children. Don't let these children around your children. Then their children end up molested or something, you know. Commandments are loving. 
But we're full of rebels today. We're going to rebel against the pastor. Even though the Bible says the bathe them, they have the rule over you because they watch for your souls. You rebel against your daddies. Rebel against your mamas. Because you're taught in this culture to be a rebel. You have to be so delicate with men today, see. Because they're so... They're just taught to be rebels. Psalms 19, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Wow. 1 John says, God's commandments leads to joy. The book of Genesis shows Cain unhappy. And God says if you would obey, you would be happy. John 15 says if you obey, your joy will be full. Let me tell you something, then I'm going to close. You've seen some brethren over the years. Maybe not, but I have. I've seen some good brothers get up here and give a testimony and cry that their daddy didn't whip them. Why would a young man in his late 20s, early 30s, why would a young man cry looking back because his daddy didn't whip him? Now as a mature adult, he could see that that was a lack of love. His daddy may have been cool, but his daddy was not showing love. I've seen another man get up here and cry because his daddy did whoop him. And his daddy did give him rules. And he stood up at the pulpit and gave a testimony and cried and says, My daddy, bless me. He wasn't perfect. But he gave me rules. And now as an adult, he can cry and shed tears of joy that he had such a daddy. Now you listen to me. I've had rebellious teenage boys in my office. And I've said, son, did you get a whipping over what you did? It was a horrible thing. I remember one case especially. Horrible thing this boy did. I said, did you get a whipping, boy? I try not to meddle in your family personally, but sometimes I just want to find out what's going on. And the boy started crying. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but he started crying. He says, my dad never whips me. I do whatever I want. And instead of saying, isn't it great being free? This boy wasn't even 20 yet. He wasn't even in his 30s. But already as a teenager, knowing he's on the wrong course, he realized it wasn't good. That it wasn't this great, wonderful thing that your daddy's such a hippie, such a passive fellow that just sits around and doesn't care about anything. Dear Holy Father, we do pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Forgive us, God, for despising your rules, for thinking they're strange, God, because the culture of baby killers is against something in your Bible, God. We love to complain about the the horrible big sins that come upon us and curse our nation, Lord. But we don't complain about the little sins that led to the big ones, God. Oh, but that would be legalism. That's what we say, Lord. Please forgive us. Forgive everyone. Lord, let us stand against this wicked culture. Let us stand against this mockery of loving rules that's so rampant everywhere we look, God. Even among conservatives, so-called. Help us learn that evil communications do corrupt good manners so we're not deceived. So we don't roll our eyes and think that somehow our children will survive the propaganda. Help us fill our children with good books and good ideas and good teaching and saturate their lives. With your truth, as you commanded us in the morning, during the day, in the evening, when we walk by the way, always, God, teach our children your truth. And I pray for a good harvest of children, Lord. I pray for parents right now to realize, you know what, I'm not making the mistake that others have made. I'm going to start whooping my child. I'm going to start requiring obedience. I'm going to start demanding respect.
Oh, Lord, we think that that's going to cause children to rebel against us, Father, but I know I've seen it. I've seen it in other people's lives. I've seen it. It's going to cause children, if it's done in love, God, it's going to cause children to just love the parent and come closer to the parent. They, they know that they have security with that parent. They know they have boundaries. They know a parent that would be willing to make them mad for their own good. They know they have true love, God. And I pray many children will walk in that security of true love and that many parents will be bold enough to give it to them and resist the lies of the devil and the culture today. Father, empower us and bless many, Father, with this sermon, with Your truth, with Your words. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank You for the blood. Thank You for salvation by grace. Thank you that if we just accept your free gift, Father, Father, through faith, you will make us a child of God forever. And we love you and thank you for loving us, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen, amen.